absolutely delighted uh, for us to have here uh, Professor Jacob Shirkow from uh, New York Law School, uh, also from uh, the uh, at New York Law, the Innovation Center for Law and Technology, um, and also from the Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia. And I don't know quite what it means to be a permanent visiting professor <laughs> I, I, at the University of Copenhagen, sure. um, where um, they have a Center for Advanced Studies in Biomedical Innovation Law. Um, so. Um, and you have an advanced degree in biomedical sciences? Uh, biotechnology. Well, yeah. Biotechnology as well as a uh, law degree. And welcome. Uh, Professor Shepal is going to be speaking to us on uh, some of the ethical issues associated with uh, what we don't know about uh, CRISPR pick and shovel. Stop. I think sure. I that yeah, <laughs> that's right. So, uh, Leslie, thank you very much. Thank you all for uh, spending a late afternoon with me here to uh, talk to you about what is otherwise a particularly wonky subject. So, um, uh, I, I think the talk, or at least, is going to be fun. Maybe that says more about my opinion of what fun is than it does the actual talk. But we will find out. But I think it's good to get you all in that mentality to start. So. Here we go, right? Gold, gold, gold from the American River, right? These are the iconic words, as you see here, heralded by Sam Brannon in uh, San Francisco's Embarcadero in May 1848 that gave rise to the California gold rush. It was also an iconic moment in the history of capitalism, believe it or not, giving birth or like other tales of the Wild West, at least claiming to have given birth to what we call today the pick and shovel play. The provision of staple goods and services to larger, more complex businesses, right? This may seem antiquated today, or even, dare I say, boring. Uh, many, uh, uh, some of you may think so. But it's important to the way modern business operates, right? and all operate in roughly the same vein as Sam Brannan, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Selling necessary wares through a combination of advertising on the one hand and secrecy on the other. Indeed, one of the more modern adaptations of this strategy, the focus of my talk today, why I'm doing this in the Law and Biomedical Sciences Colloquium, right? is for its use in vectors for gene editing technologies like CRISPR. Vector manufacturing and design is a staple requirement for most gene editing technologies, without which the gene editing machinery cannot physically get inside the cells they're supposed to edit. Vector development, despite being a staple of gene editing, is still nonetheless a little bit complicated. And so these vector developers sell their wares in a manner similar to Brannon. They partially disclose how their vector technology works in patents of all places on one hand, while keeping a substantial amount of their technology secret. Important aspects of the technology concerning safety and efficacy on the other. This raises a few bioethical issues, classical issues of bioethics to be sure, but with some new twists that I'll talk about today. Here are three of them, right? Risk, consent, and cost. Risk, it heightens uncertainty about how risky some of these gene editing, uh, uh, gene editing products are. Consent, it complicates issues concerning informed consent. Important, given gene therapy's spotty track record. And three, it has the potential to put additional price pressure on new gene therapies, all of which to date, many of you probably know, are extraordinarily expensive. But perhaps, as Sam Brandon would say, that's not all, right? Uh, this business concerning partial patent disclosure and bioethics, I think, sheds some light on a few things concerning patent disclosure generally, right? We could think of this as patent law's audience, 
the costs of inventing around a claim technology and something we refer to as product channeling. The audience, it suggests a broader, even indirect audiences for patent disclosure than engineers or even, you know, gasp, shocker patent attorneys. It hampers downstream uh, developers' ability to invent around patents in order to produce their own picks and shovels if they wished to do so. And it's likely to contribute to what we call product channeling or platform standardization, even if there's a better technology out there. This is all to say that if gene editing is a modern day gold rush, there's still a lot of money to be made in selling picks and shovels, the vectors used to get gene editors molecular equipment into cells. All right, so like I promised, right, let me describe in a little more detail Sam Brannan, the 1848 California gold rush, and picks and shovels, right? In the early part of 1848, Sam Brannan owned and operated a sleepy general store by Sutter's Mill, California. When mill workers started to come by with gold flakes panned out of the American River, Sam Brannan struck upon a brilliant idea. Right? He'd advertise the existence of the gold to the public while selling them the tin pans and other equipment to prospect for it. Further, recognizing that gold bit prospectors would know little about which equipment they should use, he'd intentionally obscure suppliers of mining equipment, which he would buy wholesale and then parcel off retail. Brannon's was arguably the greatest success story in the California gold rush, more than anyone who ever panned for gold, right? He became a millionaire in short time, buying huge tracts of land, distilleries in California, and even funding a failed rebellion in Mexico, right? That's, that's what money can buy you in 1848 in California. <laughs> Today, Brandon's story is best remembered as giving meaning to the phrase, quote, pick and shovel play, to describe a business that supplies necessary equipment to uh, more complex and often flashier businesses, right? This equipment is often, frankly, fairly simple and easy to manufacture. Think, for example, orange stoil oil storage tanks, which you see here, as the picks and shovels of the otherwise extremely lucrative oil drilling business, right? In other cases, the sale of equipment derives advantages solely from economies of scale. Amazon's cloud computing service, many of you may at least be kind of indirectly familiar with it, is a great case. Amazon provides pretty run-of-the-mill server space, but to a large portion of the internet, right? They do so, however, at leviathan scale and lightning speed, right? Amazon is the pick and shovel of many other aspects of data intensive businesses out there. Given some thought, if you have some economics training for a second, right? You may wonder like how picks and shovel plays exist at all. If the production of necessary equipment for a larger business is solely a matter of price and scale, then traditional theories of the firm, think Coase, right, would suggest that this equipment would be vertically subsumed into the manufacturing pipeline, right? And to be clear, this does happen with substantial frequency. But the secret sauce to true pick and shovel plays is secrecy, essentially information arbitrage concerning the sourcing of raw materials, the machinery that is used to process <coughs> them, and pricing information about the downstream market, right? If you want a good example of this, think car tires, right? Car manufacturers, they make a lot of their own components, right? From engine blocks to door paneling, right? And they need tires, right? Usually four per car, right? for every single car that they make. I mean, you would think that therefore car manufacturers would also be in the business of manufacturing tires, but you are wrong. No major car manufacturer makes their own tires. Tires are purchased from tire manufacturers. 
And the reason for this is not because tire manufacturers have some really revolutionary, innovative, non-replicable process for making tires, right? The process of vulcanizing rubber first disclosed in 1838. It's been 160, 160 years or so since we figured out how to make tires, right? Rather, it's because tire manufacturers have a lock on the sourcing of materials, that is natural rubber, to do this, that they do not share with car manufacturers or other competing tire manufacturers out there, right? <coughs> In writing this paper, I learned more about tire manufacturing than really was necessary, and if you want to ask me questions about it in the Q&A, I will chat your ear off, so just think about that, right? All right, all right, enough of this history and economics lesson, right? That is not this class, that is not this talk. What about gene editing? Where's CRISPR? That's why you are all here, at least so I think, right? Gene editing has its necessary equipment too. Those would be vectors, the machinery, more detail about this in a moment, about getting gene editing equipment into cells. To describe the necessity of vectors, it may be interesting to start at the gene editing technology itself. And let's take CRISPR as an example here, right? CRISPR, as many of you know, you know, it's this revolutionary technology. It allows researchers to edit the DNA of living cells more cheaply, easily, precisely, and flexibly than ever before, right? In the canonical form of CRISPR, CRISPR-Cas9, only two components are necessary. The Cas9 enzyme, that is the, I don't know, the teal blob that you see <laughs> up there, right? And a customizable single guide RNA to direct the Cas9 enzyme to a matching portion of the genomic DNA and to cleave it at a precise location, right? That's all well and good. And there is just one problem. Human cells do not endogenously express Cas9. We do not naturally encode this Cas9 enzyme. So to get CRISPR to work in human cells, one needs to find a way to either get cells to endogenously express, to make their own, that is, Cas9, or to physically get Cas9 enzymes into cells. These processes, the ways of directing Cas9 and the guide RNA into cells are done by vectors. And there are a panoply of types here are just a small sample for you here. Some use viruses to insert genetic material into cells. So cells can use their own machinery to manufacture these gene editing components. Others bind the RNA, that purple ladder single guide RNA from the previous slide, with Cas9 into a protein bundle, which people refer to as a ribonucleic protein complex, or an RNP, right? That gets physically inserted into cells. Others find ways of inserting the genetic payload into cells without using viruses, with using droplets of fat. This is our plasmid plus liposome up here that you see now. Pretty cool stuff, right? We go through, me and my co-author Chris Scott at Baylor, we go through a lot of detail of these vectors in our paper from pages 13 to 20. Yeah, that's right, seven whole footnoted pages of stuff about vectors, right? Sorry, not sorry. Which I won't <laughs> review, except to note that some come with significant risks. These include related cancers, immunological toxicity, and poor efficacy. And I want to be clear about these risks, right? Because I myself am, am kind of half on the fence about being a bioethics skeptic, right? These are not hypothetical, far-fetched boogeymen dreamed up only in the nightmares of bioethicists, right? These are real. In recent trials for a related CRISPR-based technology, we have killed more than six trial subjects. When things go wrong with vectors in clinical trials, people die, right? All right. So, <laughs> you know, um, developing and manufacturing vectors at scale is like tin pans in the California gold rush of 1848 or, or, or oil storage tanks or cloud computing servers, right? 
a pick and shovel play of the otherwise more complex and flashier gene editing business, right? A necessary piece of equipment for the CRISPR companies out there. And like other pick and shovel plays today, the vector business operates using these twin strategies of advertising and secrecy. Some of the advertising is like one could imagine, right? Typical marketing, right? You know, pamphlets, websites, going to trade shows, stuff like that. But some, oddly enough, are patents, right? A number of vector development companies advertise the novelty and disclose the basic contours of their technologies through patents and patent applications. Let me give you just a couple of examples, right? Selecta SVP, for example, is a company that manufactures vectors for gene editing companies using its patented insect cell system. It advertises this fact on its website and has filed for patents, one of which you see here, right? Unicure similarly produces an adeno-associated viral vector platform that it too patents and touts. Maxite does the same for its electroporation vector technology, literally electrocuting cells so the little pores open up in the uh, fat layer of cells so the gene editing, tech, uh, gene editing machinery can get through, right? But this advertising, as one can imagine, does not disclose everything about the technology's platforms. The coding sequences of vectors are almost never disclosed. This is important for some safety considerations when using viruses. How viral proteins are humanized for safety in different cell systems also seems to be a mystery despite these technologies' patent protection. And the safety checks that undergo manufacturing too are not entirely shared with either the, comp uh, either the public or the companies that purchase this technology from them, right? This is the secrecy aspect of the pick and shovel play. If you want yet another analogy, you can imagine a carnival barker at a circus that promises great things to see inside the tent, but inside there's a magician who is mum to the audience about ways he works his press digitation, right? In our view, this behavior in the marketplace raises two interesting, at least we think it is interesting, concern that I just want to be clear up front, we think are related, but it's not like they're inextricably intertwined with one another, right? The first are some uh, bioethical concerns that are specific to this area. The, uh, the second, some thoughts about the nature of the much maligned, uh, unfairly, in my opinion, patent disclosure requirement. Let's begin with the bioethics concerns these raise, and I can sum them up right now, right? In a single word each. Right? Risk, consent, and cost, right? Let's talk about this, right? First, the partial disclosure of vector technologies adds to an uncertainty to the level of risk conducted in clinical trials. Typically, because this is just one component of the end product, only CGMP, that's clinical good manufacturing practice information, is required to produce gene editing products to begin human experimentation. And more detailed information about vectors, especially those concerning viruses, are not always uh, publicly disclosed or even shared with gene editing development companies. If, for example, the vector sequence of a virus is unknown, Downstream developers may be uncertain with regards to whether the product has a risk of being wrongly inserted into the wrong location of the cell's genome. This was ultimately the cause of one famous clinical trial subject's death, Jesse Gelsinger, in 1999. In others, the vector itself may trigger an immune reaction in clinical trial subjects mediated by the manufacturing technology that is ultimately guarded by the vector development company. Right? This was the case with this child suffering from SCID. This is severe combination immune disorder um, that happened in a trial in that happened in a trial in France. Right? Um, partial disclosure ultimately gives the appearance of a risk-free product when, in fact, a full assessment of the risks remains shrouded to other users. Right? 
Second and relatedly, this partial disclosure and the risks they entail make informed consent for clinical trial participants rather opaque. Generally speaking, clinicians in the field consent, love the use of the active verb here, participants by explaining the risks and benefits of participating in a trial. But with only partial knowledge about how the trial products are manufactured, some of which may traffic on some pretty serious safety issues, it's hard to explain to a patient or to a clinical trial subject precisely what the risks can be, right? How do you disclose the unknown unknowns? so to speak. That's the, I guess that's the joke of this cartoon, right? This is, we think, especially problematic for gene editing given the immense hype that surrounds them. The slightly sophisticated public who thinks they know a thing or two about CRISPR, this is the most dangerous subset of the population in the United States of America, seem to falsely be under the impression that CRISPR has solved all the problems concerning gene editing, and that any safety issues that are being voiced are being barked only by, and this is not my phrase, bioethics weasels, right? <laughs> this is, uh, you could blame Steven Pinker for that one, right? This is wrong for all the reasons that I mentioned earlier because it's a real concern, right? One need only look at the state of dangerous and deadly autologous stem cell clinics to see proof of that, right? Partial disclosure for vector manufacturing and development make it increasingly difficult to consent subjects by explaining to them exactly what's at stake, which often, frankly, is their lives, right? Third, partial disclosure for vector technologies through patents may contribute to increased prices for gene editing therapies, and the ones that exist are already priced at a level that calls upon injustice in healthcare affordability. Many of you may be familiar with this company, Spark Therapeutics. They have one of the currently approved three gene editing products on the market right now. It costs a whopping $850,000. It cures a congenital form of blindness. If you want to be cheap about it, it's only four hundred fifty-seven dollars per eye, right? So I guess you can do it on the cheap, right? The mechanics for this, right, the mechanics for this increased price require a few assumptions. We detail these in our paper from pages 34 to 36. But one possibility is royalty stacking, the increasing stepwise addition of patented royalties on each component of a final product to produce a, quote, excessive price, right? If such a phenomenon exists, and there is a heated debate in the economics literature as to whether and what extent it does, which we don't try to weigh in here. If you want to see intellectual property economists come to blows, you should mention the phrase royalty stacking and sit back and have some popcorn, right? It's likely a result of companies paying royalties to vector manufacturers for aspects of their technology that they neither know they are paying for nor do they actually need. More complete disclosure of the underlying technology would, in theory, discourage this price increase by tamping down on the ultimate royalty burden. I cannot move on from this section without saying that one of the most incisive thinkers about the existence and meaning of royalty stacking is actually sitting right over there, George Contreras, right? He seems to have done a fantastic <laughs> job of cutting through some of the economics jargon as to whether or not royalty stacking, you know, rather than this, like, is it pervasive or not? George has a great article on just, like, it exists in some limited circumstances, and that's really all the information that we need to know, which is really a great way of thinking about it, right? So thank you very much, George. Right. Um, all right, those are bioethics. Let's talk about patent disclosure, right? That is, that's how the gene editing vector pick and shovel play raises some bioethical concerns. But related to these bioethical concerns, especially risk and consent, the pick and shovel play tells us a bit about the nature of patent disclosure, the requirement that patentees should fully, quote unquote, disclose their inventions, or disclose their inventions in a sufficient quantity to enable others to make and use them, right? Unlike risk, consent, and cost, right, these patent disclosure, uh, you know, these patent disclosure concerns are more nuanced than can be captured in a single word, or maybe more nuanced than at least I can capture in a single word. And 
Also, right, you know, what good patent attorney would I be if I could describe if I could describe something in one word when I can describe it in five, right? Yes, that was a that was a claim drafting joke. Fair enough, right? So to break them down, here they are, right? One, a broader audience for patents. Two, information related to the costs of inventing around a claim technology. And three, channeling suboptimal technology into standardized platforms, right? Let's briefly examine how the pick and shovel play informs us about the audience, the readers, if you will, of patents. There is a long, excellent literature about how nobody <laughs> reads patents <laughs> except for patent attorneys and possibly some scientists in some engineering heavy fields, right? But the pick and shovel play, uh, the, the pick and shovel issues with gene editing vectors <coughs> strongly suggests that patents can also serve as a form of consumer information, allowing downstream consumers to kick the tires of a technology, if you will, before buying it, right? In the gene editing vector context, perfect, or at least really good, disclosure would have allowed gene editing companies to understand the contours of the technology that they were purchasing enough to determine whether to incorporate one technology over another. I want to be clear about this. This isn't a new idea. This is not something I came up with. There's a number of scholars who have written about just this, but an indirect audience for patents. Clarissa Long with her article Patent Signals, Jonas Anderson and Ann Bartow have all suggested the same thing, although they've done so, frankly, in substantially lower tech fields, right? Mainly the like consumer products fields, like you buying like the Swiffer, for example, right? The cases here for patented vectors suggest that this may actually be true for high-tech ones as well. And I think that's something to think about. Second, and relatedly, are the costs of inventing around, as this tree has invented around another tree here, that is optimal disclosure in patents doesn't merely serve as a consumer signal whether to adopt one technology or another. It also, as required by statute, informs users how to make and use the invention such that the same users can determine whether or not to buy the patented product off the shelf or whether to design their own, make their own non-infringing alternative. Secreting away information on patented technologies, as in the case of gene editing vectors, makes this incredibly difficult. Right? Lastly, right, incomplete patent disclosure may contribute to channeling or platform standardization for suboptimal technology. All right, channeling, platform standardization. It just sounds like a bunch of jargon. What does that mean, right? Well, we mean that certain gene editing vector platforms may become standard, as in a standard parts framework, right, without a robust analysis as to whether they are truly superior, or in the case of vectors, safe, right, relative to other technologies out there. Better disclosure, by contrast, would allow others to analyze the specifications of a technology or to use technology in different or in more limited circumstances before adopting it wholesale for a broader set of uses, right? If you don't know what the other options are out there, if you don't know what you're getting into to start off with, right, you may end up being stuck with the square wheel not knowing that the circular one was an option. You want to put this maybe even slightly differently, right? Poor disclosure means that a standard may be adopted that is otherwise technically suboptimal <coughs> unsafe, or not universally applicable, despite the fact that it's the standard. So ultimately, we think, my co-author and I, think this all serves as a case study for what happens with partial patent disclosure of upstream technologies, or you know, component technologies. In some cases, like here, and in other cases related to the delivery of healthcare, this partial disclosure regime may raise more than a few ethical concerns. And beyond that, this incomplete disclosure may in fact illuminate a few things about patent disclosure and its importance. And its importance like not just from this techno-legal perspective about you know, whether you've complied with some section, you know, some paragraph of section 112, but a consumer market one too. 
Investigation into behavior like this should allow downstream users of even sophisticated pick and shovel technology to critically eye the sort of hype that was displayed by those iconic words from Sam Brannan in 1848. Gold, gold, gold from the American River. Right? All right, so that's it. That's the end of my talk. And with that, I'm more than happy to, to take any and all of your questions to the best that I am able. The floor is yours. Uh, so, is there usually a cue? Do I, you know, point at people and yeah, call upon can, them by clothing? Is that the? Uh... <laughs> I can. I saw Rick. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, so some of your concerns, um, I guess, about the information imbalance, do you think that, that I guess, the buyers of these patents or these technologies have the obligation to ask for these types of disclosures when they purchase this technology? Is that a way that these problems can be addressed realistically? Yeah, right. So when you say obligation, I think there's kind of two types, right? The kind of first is like, do they have a legal obligation to ask for this information? And the second is like, do they just want the information, right? With respect to the legal obligation, I certainly don't think so, right? I mean, you know, if you are manufacturing a complex drug and you need a component that goes into it and someone is, you know, says or claims or you find out that they're, you know, that their manufacturing practice is certified, like you're done. You don't have to go and like inspect the lab from which they're actually manufacturing it, right? So I don't necessarily think that there's a legal obligation. When it comes to desire, I certainly think the desire is there. So one particularly good example is this company, Selecta SVP. Let's go back for a moment. Yeah, they're the ones who make a lot of the stuff using insect cells right here, right? This is, you know, anyway. Um, they're working with a company, Spark Therapeutics, the one who's manufacturing the gene, the, the, the gene editing technology for this congenital form of blindness out there. And they've had a lot of manufacturing trouble, and so they've been hitting up Selecta for a long, long time to figure out exactly how, it's, how they get their technology to work. And needless to say, Selecta has been mum. Right, and so this has come up at um, at least one conference that I attended that dealt with the prices of gene therapies. Uh, Spark Therapeutics CEO said, "Like we need a manufacturing partner because we're not manufacturers, right? And like we can't do this ourselves. They're not telling us how to not telling us how to do it. You have to pay them. You know, you have to pay them something." Um, uh, I don't know. If Selecta is Spark Therapeutics is a publicly traded company. This comes up in the 10Ks that they that they file. So. There's the, there is a will, but there's not necessarily a, w a way, right? One way of thinking about this is as more competition develops in the marketplace, right, there could be a flight to disclosure, like that's possible, right? We, I just, we, we, we have not seen that yet, right? So, you know, th this could, my, this, our article could be obsolete in about 10 years or so, but that's certainly not, not the case now, right? Um, and I, 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 I saw your hand. I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So <clears throat> let me ask a clarifying question first, sure. just to make sure I'm understanding it, because most of this is over my head. <laughs> then maybe my second question will be new. Um, from the paper, it sounded like you were saying that one of the problems is these vector creators feel rushed to get a patent, because if they don't do it in time, they lose it before they are able to go through all of the trial process and fully understand how it works and operates. Is that accurate? Yes, right? So, you know, in patent law, right, there's something called the statutory bars, right, right, which essentially prohibit you from filing for a patent application on something that you disclosed, you know, more than 12 months, something you publicly disclosed more than 12 months prior. Um, <clears throat> some hang up as to whether this applies to clinical trials or not, but a lot of these uh, vector developers are not actually undergoing clinical trials themselves. So before they put it in a gene editing product and that company starts clinical trials, they run off and they kind of run off and get patents. There's this issue with respect to biomedical patents as to exactly when you need to file and the, and the kind of zeitgeist is as, as early as you humanly can. And I could chat your ear off about why that's sub suboptimal, um, but that's <laughs> the way that the world works. So if, if they somehow solve that problem and and gave them time to safely go through all the trials and still hold on to this potentially valuable patent in the future. Um, I guess my question is, you still think most of it goes back to just intentionally withholding 
this yeah. information. So, so, so to be just clear, right, the, 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 the information that gets chosen to be patented and the information that's withheld, right, that is absolute intent. That is a strategic decision that these companies make, right? And things like manufacturing technologies, for example, tend to be kept as trade secrets because they are relatively difficult for someone else to reverse engineer. It's cheaper to hold a trade secret. They last forever in some, in some instances. There's, there's one drug um, called Premarin out there, P-R-E-M-A-R-I-N. Right, um, it is an estrogen derivative that's manufactured from mare urine, right? Pre mare in, right? Um, and the the manufacturing, you know, it sounds like easy, like let's just get some mare urine, right? But the, the manufacturing, you know, I mean, as one does at Whole Foods or something, right? Um, um, but the manufacturing process has been has been secret now. I think for seventy plus years. I think we're kind of approaching eighty right now, right? Um, so manufacturing processes tend to be kept as trade secret because they're difficult to reverse engineer. Some of this other stuff that gets disclosed in the patent application uh, gets disclosed because it would be inordinately easy for companies to figure some of this stuff out, right? For using, for example, in electroporation technology, like the fact that that is what you are doing, right, is something that other downstream companies are going to know. But the specifications of exactly how you do it are not, and that could be the difference between getting it to work or not, right? So this is one of the reasons why our paper focuses on patent disclosure. Yeah. Okay. George. Thank you. So um, a follow-up on, on Rick's question about sort of the mode of disclosure here. And, and part of it has to do with who, who would be the audience for this disclosure, right? And you've got a few possibilities. Um, you mentioned Spark, right? So the gene editing vendor itself wants to know how the vector that's now operating in its therapy works. So there's Spark. There's the public, I guess, who's a potential you know, audience for this. There's sure. the regulator, you know, the FDA. Yeah. I'm not going to go there. We've already talked about the FDA. Um, but if the vector manufacturer just wants to satisfy its customer, right? if the selectors of the world just want to stop Spark from getting up at conferences and saying, we don't know what our vendor is doing, well then, Selecta could just enter into a non-disclosure agreement with Spark and disclose some of these technique, techniques just to Spark. Um, that wouldn't have to go in the patent disclosure. The public would still be in the dark. The regulators would still be in the dark. Um, but then it seems like the principal group complaining about non-disclosure, right, the gene editing vendors, they'd be satisfied. So why isn't that happening? Because it seems like that would be the most expedient thing for Selecta to do, and wouldn't that still be a problem? I mean, my sense is that we want the public to know about how this works. Yeah, right, so, so breaking up the disclosure audience or the target of disclosure into two groups, right? You know, first let's start off with the gene editing companies themselves, and then maybe the public after that, right? Let's start with the gene editing co companies themselves, right? We've got a trade secret, why not file an NDA? That's the way that we typically handle these, you know, that's the way that we typically handle these things. Um, and maybe the kind of short and blunt answer is that if you're Selecta, you don't have to, right? You know, if you're Spark, right, and you have to use, an, you know, a certain adenoviral vector, right, that's the construct that you have. We've determined this is going to be best for the particular type of tissue that we want to target and something like that. You don't have a whole lot of options out there. And so if you're a company like Selecta, for example, there's a lot of cards that you hold. On top of that, NDAs are great, but you know what's better than an NDA when you want to keep a trade secret? Just not telling somebody something, right? So there's obviously <laughs> so there's obviously some risks involved here. And this does not, like I was mentioning earlier, about you know, if you want to think about traditional theories of the firm, this stuff tends to get vertically subsumed. We can think of NDAs actually as like a kind of you know hybrid coalescing of like one particular firm. There's still kind of competition in this area here. On top of that, you know, but wait, there's more, right? Um, you know, a lot of these companies, you know, th this is a, this, the, 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 I want to call them administrative scientists, but, you know, the, like, he, like the, the CSOs and the people who are in the C-suite and have a scientific background in these companies, there's a lot of revolving door stuff. Everybody knows that, right? And so one of the things that you really, really want to avoid is signing an NDA with Spark only to have the Spark C CSO leave and start a new company. Like, you know, what's that person going to do? It's really difficult to lock up, you know, NDA information in their own mind afterwards. So there's, 
Some substantial risks to NDAs here. I don't want to suggest that these are unique, but they're certainly prevalent in this, like, you know, um, Series E biotech startup about to go IPO field. That that is a particular concern, right? Um, Can I just yeah. just one quick interjection? NDA is non-disclosure. Oh, I'm sorry. Agreement. Yes. CSO is chief scientific officer. Yes. Right. Okay. Just to make sure everybody. And if there are any other acronyms, <laughs> this is one of the things to know about biotech. It's the world of acronyms. And I don't know many of them either. And, 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 In fact, and, I started thinking, is an NDA a new drug application? That's yeah. We were talking about the FDA, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, no, no, no. Wait that's... a minute. That doesn't make sense. Yeah. But, that, oh. but that before other people, I got several questions online. Sure, sure, just please. Just to make sure. Some people wanted to know what the FDA does do. Some people wanted to know why the FDA isn't doing and, and or what could the FDA do. Great, right? So let me, let, me, let, me do this, let me do the second question first, like what can the FDA do, right? So this paper, this is a paper about one particular disclosure failure in the patent context that is not to suggest but there are not other entities out there who could do a really great job at forcing a lot of these manufacturers' hands when it comes to disclosing the nitty-gritty of their technology out there. And maybe the, the, the primary agency, right, other than patent examiners, is FDA, right? Um, they could certainly do that in theory if they, quote, wanted to. And by wanted to, I mean legally authorized to. One of the particular problems that FDA has is that when it comes to manufacturing technologies, when it comes to component technologies of complex products, right, FDA allows a lot of companies to keep their manufacturing information as, quote, confidential business information, which you could disclose to FDA, but FDA is not going to release to anybody else. And by the way, that sometimes, depending upon the way that things are structured, include the final company that is the company filing the IND, which is an investigative new, new drug application for a particular product, right? Let me give one example to maybe make this a little bit more interesting, right? Um, I think everyone is at least passingly familiar with the EpiPen, right? This is the epinephrine auto injector. If you have an allergic reaction, like if you're allergic to shellfish and you, know, you end up going to a crab shack and you gotta save, 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 save your own life, right? You give yourself an EpiPen shot, right? Um, so one of the really peculiar things about the EpiPen that does not get talked about a lot is that manufacturing the glass syringes to spec and to scale is one of the most difficult things uh, out there in the world of you know auto injector technology, right? Like literally making this glass tube, making a glass tube that's not going to break in transit, making a glass tube that's not going to freeze at a certain temperature, making sure that not enough light gets in, such that the drug doesn't degrade over time. Doing this in lots of millions, doing it quickly, right? Kind of all of this stuff. So th there's actually this it shocks me. There is one company that manufactures all of these glass tubes for auto injectors. They're called, it's either SMH or SMF or something like that. Um, and that's essentially all that they do. Their manufacturing process for this is a closely guarded secret, which they do not disclose to FDA. They do not disclose to, for example, Mylan, who's the maker of the EpiPen, the EpiPen branded EpiPen. Um, and so we can imagine a world where FDA says, you know, you're going to do stuff like that. You've got to not only tell us what you're going to do, but you're, you can't keep that as confidential business information, but that's not the statutory authority that FDA has. Right? This is a little bit different. We're talking about things like viral supernatant, like literally like a liquid, right? A, you know, palish liquid that just has a bunch of virus particles in it. But same principle with that and the syringes that make EpiPen apply there as apply here as apply there, right? So that's on what FDA can and can't do, and maybe I think that kind of answers some question about like why they don't, right? I mean, it's 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 a matter of we give companies a long rope in the manufacturing process for how they interact with FDA. Things in Europe seem to be a little more seems to be more of a press for disclosure there, but there's still a lot of stuff you can keep confidential in an application with the EMA, which is the European Medicines Agency, which is the FDA analog in the uh, European Union. So that's 
possible, right? I don't want to suggest that it's not. Um, so aside from the FDA, <coughs> this may be a really naive question, but is there is there any way that like private companies could force disclosure through uh, antitrust law? It says here in the article that there is sometimes maybe poor disclosure could give rise to antitrust violation. Is that like? All right. So I don't know that much about any of this. So. No, 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 no. Sure. Right. So, so if one of these products becomes so standard, right? Like you can imagine the case with the glass vials in the uh, EpiPen case. One of these, you know, vector platforms becomes so standard that there's no other competitors out there. In other words, this vector platform developer, right, has a monopoly on the marketplace as defined by the Sherman Act, right? We can imagine that one of the ways to, you know, break that trust, you know, since we're using metaphors from the 19th century, right, to break, one of the ways to break that trust, right, would be to require disclosure of what these manufacturing practices are so there could be more competition out there. That is, that, that's not exactly kind of where the market is at now, right? But to the extent it goes, you know, to the to the to the extent that some of these companies are successful and others go out of business, and it seems like we've only got a couple players in town, that very well may be possible, right? Um, talk a little bit more about that, but why don't I stop there in case there's other other questions? Thoughts? My question was regarding the role of torts in all this. Do you see a role in, um, the, because it seems like you said something about intent, they intentionally leave out some of the um, manufacturing process um, information, and given that it's safety, and you have mentioned that people have died, and has there ever been yeah. a role in that? Yeah, you know, that's a really, that's a really great question, right? Um, so I, I'm going to, you're going to, Please forgive me. I'm going to think about this like a tort typo on an exam, right? Mm -hmm. So if you were to have a tort, right, it would probably sound in negligence. Negligence, duty, breach, cause, harm, right? And so the thing you start getting hung up with a little bit is duty, right? Um, so if you're the, you know, I don't know, you are the harmed plaintiff, right, and you want to sue the company that harmed you that, you know, you were a participant in a clinical trial for, uh, I, I am confident that when you sign whatever informed consent form you sign, you essentially waive away everything except your life, right? Um, to the extent that there's a duty between the vector manufacturer and the gene editing developer, I, I don't necessarily think that there is one for the reasons that I stated earlier. Um, what about there, product liability? Sorry? Product liability? Yeah, I mean, product liability. Yeah, it's a, a component part manufacturing. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess that that's I guess that that's possible. Yeah, I mean, it's you know, it is it is possible. I mean, again, I wonder whether some of this is obviated by people signing informed consent. You know, people signing informed consent stuff, right? Obviously, there's some states like California, for example, have really strict limitations on how much you could sign away in the product's liability space. I haven't looked at the California Products Liability Statute in a long time, and I wonder whether or not there's exceptions for biomedical technologies like this, just for the reason because if there were not, then there'd be no clinical trials held in California. So I, I don't know, but it's possible. It's a good, it's a good question. It's worth, it's worth, it's worth noodling over. Um, I don't know. I'll ask you a pushback question Please. about informed consent. Um, so, why do I have to know exact the exact mechanisms that create the risk? Why wouldn't it be enough for informed consent for me to know that there are these potential problems with the vectors? They have been manifest in some recent trials. We know that five people died in this trial using this vector out of whatever the N was, whatever the sure. denominator was. Four. Why isn't that all I need to know that I'm taking a 50-50 crapshoot with my life? Right. Great, great question, right? So the question is whether or not informed consent is sufficient 
if the consent to the patient is kill or cure. Right? Like, you know, it may kill you. 50-50 chance. Yeah, it may kill you, it may cure you, and that's all that you need to know. We argue a little bit in our paper that that's, like, not enough, right? That informed consent is real consent. We want patients to know, like, exactly what the particular risks are. And some of those are specific to the technology here. So the clinical trial deaths that I was talking about earlier are in this related technology called CAR-T, right? And essentially, they take out certain white blood cells in your body, they re-engineer those, they insert them back into your body, and those white blood cells go and, you know, fight a particular cancer that they have primed it to. One of the, one of the greatest, I, I, there's no other way of saying this, one of the greatest advances in oncology history and uh, anyway, right? Um, when some of these clinical trials were being started, there were a number of companies that were doing this, and one of the companies that was running it was this company, Juno, that used uh, Juno Therapeutics that used a particular adjuvant, uh, a, 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 a chemical that is included often in the manufacturing process with this stuff that caused uh, serious neurotoxicity in patients. It went to their brain. They had a, um, a particularly severe immune reaction called a cytokine shock, and they died, right? And so the question is, if you were to start off, you know, under this kind of veil of ignorance and say, you know, there's one possibility where I tell patients, kill or cure, that's all you need to know. And there's another one where I say, you may be cured, nothing could work, you can have this particular severe immune reaction and you could die, you could get inserted into the wrong place, you're not going to find it until years later, right? I, I mean, my impression of informed consent is that true informed consent is the latter and not the former. If you think it's just the former, then everything we said about informed consent does not apply. If you think it's the latter, you think informed consent is true informed consent as opposed to formalistic informed consent, right? Then I think it is actually important to uncover what the unknowns are in order to clue patients in into exactly what may happen to them, right? And I think this also traffics on issues of things like pain, right? Kill or cure, that sounds fine, but what about kill and, well, you know, what about cure or immediately before you die, you're going to be in just like horrific, excruciating pain? Like that's a little bit different. Or at least maybe some patients would think that that's a little bit different, right? So, I mean, I, I think it goes to what level of information you think is sufficient for informed consent purposes from a bioethical standpoint. I mean, I guess I guess I think what you need to have, I mean, I'll, I'll devil's advocate this a little sure, bit. Sure, sure, no, no, please. You need to have realistic expectate, um, explanations of the different kinds of risks and the likelihood of each of those risks. But do you need to understand the cellular process that generates the risk. I mean, it's sort of like, let's take gallbladder surgery. Uh, you, there's a risk of nicking the bile duct. Uh, now that risk might be higher if the doctor uses a certain instrument or lower, depending on the instrument. But do you need to know all of the details about the mechanism of the instrument, or do you just need to know that your doctor is going to use a surgical technique, black box the technique, where there is an end chance, roughly, of nicking your bile duct, which is going to have certain kinds of very unpleasant consequences. Yeah, right. I, I, you know, again, I think it goes to what level of information is sufficient for informed consent or not. Some of it, frankly, may be pretty patient specific, right? Um, some patients may really want to know more about like exactly what the potential risks are. And it is difficult to ascertain exactly what the risks are if, you know, the two people further upstream, the clinician and the gene editing development company don't know exactly the manufacturing processes that went into that. And for some patients, I'm assuming that just like, you know, I don't know, life or death, 50-50 shot, like that's going to be enough for them. Um, I, I don't, frankly, I don't necessarily think I have like a great answer for like when you approach that threshold or whether it should be patient specific or not. Um, but, I mean, I think to the extent that you think that at least more information than, for example, you know, there's a 6 out of 40 chance that something really awful is going to happen to you, like, and that's all that I'm going to tell you, right? Um, to the extent you think that more is necessary, at least having some additional information other than that that's being provided today, I think, would be significant. I think it would be important, right? 
so kind of piggybacking on that, um, this whole time I've kind of been, and I don't know a ton about this, so forgive my ignorance, but we were talking, this discussion about informed consent, I was thinking about, like, what, which consumers um, are really at risk? I don't know if uh, it's not like I go to the doctor off like because I got like a cold and I'm gonna go do some gene editing procedure. Um, but I do Hopefully think not. those those who um, experience that type of uh, issue are probably more inclined to want more information. But um, I guess my thought is: is there like from a realistic perspective, from a consumer, from a patient? Is there sort of a blinded by the light type of um, uh, issue where you just turn off to the excess like cellular level information? And I, does, does disclosure really help that risk to the patient? That is a that is a that is a great that is a great question, right? So two ways of thinking about it, right? The first is like specific to CRISPR, and the second deals with informed consent more generally. So let's talk about informed consent more generally, right? There is definitely an information overload problem, right? I mean, you start to run afoul of a formed consent at some level beyond which patients or clinical subjects do not want to hear about more information. Raise your hand if you've gone skydiving. Okay, when you had to sign your <coughs> dismemberment waiver, <laughs> right? You know, how long was it? Was it like 20 pages or something? Did you actually read through it? You're like, whatever, I'm jumping out of a plane, who cares, right? You know, meanwhile, like, you know, people, you know, <laughs> you you actually sat and, yeah. So, no, so no, 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 okay, I was gonna say, <laughs> see, someone wants more information for informed consent purposes. No, um, you know, they're, you know, I'm jumping out of a plane, you know, but, you know, there are people who get, you know, injured, you know, like on their way to board the plane, they get like, you know, caught in the hooks behind, you know, stuff like that, stuff that I think is somewhat unanticipated. Um, and I think at some point people tune out. And I do certainly think that this is an informed consent problem in the medical literature, generally speaking. And there's actually a lot of stuff about this. One of the, Michelle Mello at Stanford had an article, it's either recent or it's actually a couple, a couple, of, a couple of years ago, about like what the optimal level of information is for true informed consent. Like we're gonna give people a quiz afterwards, right? And we're gonna assume that the quiz is coextensive with like, you've been properly consented. Um, then, you know, about figuring out what the appropriate level of the information is, right? And I think, you know, one of the non-surprising aspects of that is, like, it, it is a upside-down U-shaped curve, right? There's some point beyond which where people know less, right? So that's a general informed consent problem. On the CRISPR-specific side, I do think there's a, a really significant hype issue. Right, people with a variety of genetic illnesses think, oh my God, CRISPR gene editing, I have this genetic illness, I don't care what the risks are. And I'm not entirely sure that that is true if they were actually informed of what the risks are, right? Um, um, since we're talking, and since we're, since we're like on this, on this thing, so just three super quick examples of people wish they knew more in the getting you know, medical treatment space, right? First things first. Lasix, right? A lot of literature about people regret getting Lasix. Why? Although they have 20-20 vision, a lot of people cannot see at night. A lot of people have double vision or triple in some cases, right? And this was not consented to them when they underwent the particular procedure. They are miserable, right? Uh, thing number thing number two, prostate surgery, right? A lot of people are like, oh, I got prostate cancer. My doctor says I should get prostate surgery. And then their quality of life afterward takes a nosedive. And these people think like, I wish I just lived with the cancer, right? This is worse than what the illness was. And they were not properly, if they had more information of what the potential hangups were, they would not have undergone the surgery. Third thing, stem cell treatment, right? People are so hyped into stem cell treatment that they're doing things like running off to unlicensed clinics, right? And getting uh, autologous stem cell, uh, uh, stem cell treatment, in other words, you know, cells being removed from their body, engineered, put back in. Um, and and people, are, people are dying, right? Um, because their bodies are, for example, developing a severe immune reaction to this, and they are you know, not given enough information that this is a possibility. Also, it's not approved by FDA, we can talk about that stuff, right? <laughs> there's, all of these, there's all of these cases in which people think they know what the risks are, but their hype about the benefits of the technology, I think, blinds them to 
listening to only basic information about what the risks are. If they really, in my opinion, if they were really given more information, they would at least think more carefully about this stuff, right? Can we'll follow up on that? I mean, I'll, I'll follow up on that. Then. Sure. Because none of those involve understanding the, the actual details of the True. science. They all involve not having been told some very important possible thing that could happen that's a realistic possibility. Not what's going on at the cellular level. Not there to take the prostate cancer example, not telling you that one of the side effects of the surgery may be that you can no longer have intercourse or that you're incontinent. Right. Now, in order to know that, you don't know you don't need to know what the surgical process is that leads to incontinence. Sure. Although the surgeon does, right? But if the yeah. surgeon is blinded from that information, then the surgeon cannot inform the patient of what those risks are. Which actually, if I could, if I could ask you, there are two other questions that I got sure. from, from students uh, that are sort of related to this. Sure. Which is, if we think consumers need to get this information, what's the best way to have a disclosure regime yeah. that gets it? Is it one one person asked it about? Is it through patents? Uh, another person asked. You know, just in a more the more general version of the question, if it's not through patents, where else? Yeah. So again, you know, this is a paper that about the particular deficiencies in the patent disclosure regime. The assumption that we have, and maybe it's a poor one, right, is that better disclosure here would, you know, I don't know, flow downhill or something like that, right? It would then pass to the gene editing developers, we'd pass it to clinicians and to reps, we'd be able to. I don't know, inform patients or not exactly what the specific risks are, right? So a lot of this is assuming, right, that there's, you know, a significant amount of information flow from beginning to end, right? So in terms of what the best way to inform patients are, I would say in the usual course of things that we usually inform patients, right, generally speaking, it's the clinician who informs such clinical trial subjects of what the, um, you know, what the particular risks of undergoing a clinical trial are. But the hang-up, or at least the hang-up that we make in our paper, is that there's essentially two levels of, I don't know, you want to think of it this way, information friction, right? Uh, the clinician doesn't have the, cl the clinician does not have the information the clinician needs to tell the patient, because the clinician tends to get information from the IND, the investigative new, new drug file, gets information from the IND filer, and the IND filer doesn't have the information because the manufacturer isn't telling the IND filer about it. Right, so so that's what the that's what the assumption is, right? You know, we can talk about whether that's realistic or not. Um, this is at least one area to one area to do that, right? Possibly. I think. Yeah. Last thing and I are thinking the same way because really, what the patient wants to know is what the risks are, and then the information is what kinds of risks can be specific on the line being confident, but they don't really need to know. They may be curious, but I don't think it disables their disclosure to know what the mechanic, what the mechanism is that pr produces the risk. No, they, right. don't, they don't need that. Sure. Really. I don't, I, that, that's how I... No, 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 no. That. Yeah. But sure. another factor, just when you're talking about probabilities of these adverse events, when you're starting out a testing regime, you don't have good probabilities because you don't have good end. You don't have the number of test subjects. So you're giving huge probability, like one out of four. Yeah, you had eight yeah. people, two of them got screwed. Right. Okay. So, but after a while, over time, that product and that procedure begins to get a better reliability because there are more subjects, more test subjects. And so as time goes on, those probabilities can be more precise. But I still don't think for a valid, you know, waiver, you need to know what those are. 
but you need to know what they are in detail. Sure, sure. That's what interests the, the patient. Yeah, sure. I, to be clear, I'm not asking that patients become surgeons or yeah, molecular yeah. biologists or something like that, but there is, again, this information mm -hmm. friction between people who know and the patient, right? The ultimate thing is how to get that information to patients, and you, and you cannot do that without this information that some of the manufacturers have. Who should be the guardian of that? How, should that, how that should get to patients? We have, we have one particular thought for one particular paper, but I can imagine there'd be a myriad of ways to do it otherwise. Well, I think there's a natural experiment here. That oh, cool. Okay. Right? Hopefully that doesn't so, kill people. So <laughs> the pharmaceutical industry, right, so there are patents covering the active ingredients, the, uh, the small molecule drugs, and so forth. And they have patent disclosure requirements, too. But not only that, the FDA, completely separately from patent disclosure, has labeling requirements, right, and warning requirements in pharmaceutical advertising. And, and I guess... If the idea here is that these vector manufacturers should disclose more of their patents so that it trickles down and informs patients about risks, how good or how much risk information could you glean from, you know, Pfizer's patents on their small molecule drugs? And I know you're shaking your head because it's like absolutely none. Uh, no, he is. Oh, okay. And, yeah. and, 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 you know, so because of that, if that's the case, then I mean that's why the FDA has layered on top of any patent disclosure um, significant, you know, safety labeling and advertising requirements. And and uh, but I don't, I don't know if you've looked at that and compared. I mean, you could compare Pfizer's patents on twenty different drugs with their actual uh, marketing safety uh, disclosure requirements and see if you could glean what's in the safe products from the patents. Yeah. So, so one of the, so in theory that is a great idea. I think it's probably a better idea for complex products, right? Things like EpiPen and stuff like that than necessarily is for small molecule products. One of the reasons for that, and there's a couple of reasons for that, one of the reasons for that is that manufacturing in the pharmaceutical context does in fact tend to be vertically integrated. So there is like some really excellent information flow from manufacturers to the ultimate NDA, new drug application filer. Right. Um, on top of that, the I, I, I just realized I have a mouthful of jargon right now. The pharmaceutical excipients. Whoa, what's that? Like the like the actual like sugars that are used to make a pill. Like if you ever take like a tablet of Tylenol, like the actual like crushable thing, right? Like the, it's, it's sugar, right? So pharmaceutical excipients like rarely have you know the type of like life or death safety issues that like you know an incorrectly manufactured virus does, right? And so I, I, I don't think that like you're going to have a numerator that is going to be that informative almost ever, right? Um, now that I've said that, I just realized I have actually one good counterexample to that, right? Um, and that is uh, for opioids, right? They now sell a sublingual film. It's like a Listerine, a Listerine breath strip, literally, except it's for pain relief and has an otherwise dangerous drug. <laughs> Manufacturing is tough, although it does tend to be vertically integrated, right? And so one of the risks is that too much drug gets delivered too quickly. So you could take a look at some of the sublingual film opioid manufacturers and see if you could, in fact, glean information from the pets, right? So, so, so that, is one, that is one possible area, right? Um, but, but that's one of the reasons why it's like it's somewhat of an imperfect balance. In the, in the, in the complex combination drug product, right, it, then there, I think there is something to look at. And so I, I, will, I will definitely think about that. Thank you. That's, that's great. That's helpful. I just want to vocalize my shaking head because <laughs> I don't think patents really in any but the rarest cases deal in probabilities of success or dealing failures and probability of failures, they, if there are, were uh, failures of prototypes that are prior to the best mode, uh, they're disclosed maybe, but there's no probability to it. And I would say patents are not a place where you're going to get any of this information, any kind of disclosure, help for one of these uh, waivers. I just, it's not a stream of information that was created for that purpose. Yeah, uh, well, it doesn't so. doesn't have that in standard. Yeah, right. So it, it's definitely not the way things operate now. That is for sure. And obviously, statutory bars, the you know, one year, as I mentioned this earlier, the one year statutory bars, it, 
is a, is a huge hang-up to kind of making this operative, right? Um, but at the same time, I mean, you know, look, I'm a, I'm a patent attorney, and I've got my Section 112 hammer, and everything looks like a disclosure nail. <laughs> and, you know, if we're, if we're, if we're serious, if we're, if we're real serious about, you know, patent laws make and use requirement, well, I got some information about not making something that's patented, right? I, I mean, that's, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure <laughs> what else to say. Well. But that's not, it's make and use, not not make and not use. Right. You're just not going to get that information through the yeah. bad system. Yeah, I, it's, it, it is not with the statutory bars. It yeah. is going to be tough, right? Yeah. I don't want to suggest otherwise, right? But it's, uh, anyway. Did, did uh, the person who wanted to know how patent law could be reformed <laughs> to do that get <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, um, I mean, look, you know, I, I am, I am, I, I will, you know, stand out on this, you know, a thin reed on a rocky ledge or something like that. You know, um, I, I am a, I'm a firm believer in the normative good of patent disclosure. Like, like it, it can do good things. It should do good things. Um, and that the statutory bars in some instances, especially where things like clinical trial and safety tests and stuff like that are needed, that take more than one year, right? That the statutory bars do more harm than good, right? So now that I've said that, right, now I'm going to channel my inner uh, Marty Edelman, who's a, a, an irascible professor at GW <laughs> Law School, and say that statutory bars, we've had them for over, a, for over a century. They make sure the public gets access to the technology after the thing has actually ended. It's the part of treaties, the only treaties the United States respect. How dare you badmouth the statutory bars, right? <laughs> um, uh, um, and, and if I were really doing my Marty impression, there'd be a lot of four-letter words in there, too. Um, You've got to use your gold rush voice. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, you know, um, uh, one day, I hope in your legal careers, you all have a judge like Marty. Uh, it will be an interesting experience for you. Um, so anyway, um, so, so you know, th those, are, those are some, I don't know, arguments to consider about why I may be wrong about the statutory bars. But, you know, if we really want people to only file for patents on inventions that they have disclosed and that actually work, sometimes we may want to think about giving them more time, right? So, you know, that's my, that's my spiel on at least one way in which the patent system could be reformed to uh, better this process. But I, I, I will assure you that this, is, this will fall on deaf ears to anyone who is involved in the patent policy area. Um, besides the hype that you mentioned earlier, why why are we not hearing? That? I mean, I feel like the conversation with CRISPR is usually germline editing or other issues, other ethical issues. But I don't think I've heard a lot of this particular process manufacturing tech issues about ethical concerns. Um, so, is there? Do you see like why? Why? <laughs> I guess it's about, besides the hype. Well, <laughs> now you have. Yeah. No. no, no have, um, yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, you know, why why aren't we hearing kind of more stuff about the bioethical concerns about like the nuts and bolts about how this actually works, right? Um, so a couple of thoughts, right? First, like you know, there are some people who are in fact writing about you know some of the ethical concerns about the nuts and bolts of the way that this stuff works, right? It's not like I'm the only person out there doing that. There is a group of European bioethicists slash STS people called Ara Arij, I don't, you know, I have a whiteboard, you know, hammered nails whiteboard here, Arij, Arij, anyway, right, um, a lot of the people are writing about stuff just like this. There are some scientists that are writing about some of the deficiencies, some of the ethical concerns of deficiencies in this technology, especially things like CRISPR not actually being as precise as we think that it may be and some of the risks that possibly could be involved there, right? Um, we are hearing about some of the, you know, I don't know if you think this is a bioethics issue or not, I think it's at least a public health issue, some of the, some of the pricing concerns that go into CRISPR technologies or are likely to go into CRISPR technologies. We had a statement from Novartis, I think now three or four months ago, saying, hey, we're developing, you know, we, we have plans on developing a drug candidate, uh, a CRISPR drug candidate. And one of the reasons that we have plans of developing a CRISPR drug candidate is because our actuaries um, 
uh, have told us that we could sell it for five million bucks a pop, right? Um, and so, um, you know, I, 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 I think I think there is some literature out there and stuff like that. Why is no one kind of picked up on the like vector stuff specifically? I, I don't really know because honestly, I mean, just to be kind of blunt, right? Pick any pick any topic, right? Cars or anything. And then put the word manufacturing after that, and people go to sleep, right? People are just like manufacturing, boring, blah, right? And so, you know, it, it takes a particular type of person, a not so interesting, lame person like the person standing in front of you who's like, cool, manufacturing, let's learn about like vulcanized rubber. And anyway, that's, um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I just think that's one of the, one of the reasons why. Th this is in the, in the realm of stuff, I, I, I'm going to be as, in the realm of stuff to talk about CRISPR. Think about all the ethical issues out there, pricing, germline editing, off-target cuts. This is, I assure you, this is the least sexy area of CRISPR, <laughs> right? Um, and that's why, I think. I don't know. Well, there's another reason, and I just, I, you know, our society continues to downplay the usefulness of knowing about science. Yeah. And being able to talk about science and investing time in reading about science or watching about science. We just downplay it. We want the car to run, and when it doesn't, we want somebody else to fix it, and we want it to run, and we just don't have the patience or the time, and maybe we're not supposed to, to figure out why it runs or some of those defects. There's a vast illiteracy about science that makes all of this stuff like for experts. Forget it. Yeah, they yeah. I mean, I, I, I think the that's. Won't know that. I, I, I think people want the, want the hype and not the guts, yeah. right? And, and I think that that's it. My, um, uh, my grandmother developed leukemia last year, and I uh, don't live anywhere near her. And my mom had gone into her with all of her oncologist appointments, and you know, look at me, like I study drugs and monoclonal antibodies and stuff. So like aside from being concerned, right, I also have like an academic interest in like what's happening. Like, you know, I want you to like scan me the blood test results and send them to me because I'm, you know, also interested in this stuff. Right? And my mom got done with uh, uh, my I, I'm pretty sure she has not taken a science class since tenth grade and I'm also assuming that she attended. Right? Um, so uh, she uh, attended science class, to be clear, right? Um, and, you know, uh, she gets done with an oncologist appointment. And so the question that I want to know is my mom said, oh, she got prescribed some antibody or something like that. All right, which, like, what's the name of the drug that your mom is about to go get intravenously injected in an outpatient clinic? <laughs> what's the name of it? Right? I don't know. Maybe it starts with an R or something. I'm just like, you know. I, 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 yeah, uh, it, it just, yeah, I don't know, I don't know. Maybe on that appeal for sure. scientific literacy, <laughs> we ought to thank Professor Shekhar. <laughs> for food for further thought. Uh, Coming in. Yeah,